morning. How many were across the Widow Tap field? All right, excellent, excellent. Well, the Widow Tap field was obviously a very, very easy walk, and I'm going to start off logistically by sounding like I'm going to try to talk you all out of going. <laughs> but seriously, if any aspect of what I describe you think you are not physically able or not properly dressed for, it is better not to, not to go along and not to risk it. Um, as uh, one of the common phrases of the campaign, there will be no turning back once we take off from the, uh, the railroad bed that we are right beside. But uh, this is one of the, the longest uh, times that we've allotted for a program, and that's because of the amount of walking. Um, we do have two and a half hours for this program. Of the walking, only about 10% of it is going to be on something that is some kind of a prepared road-like surface. 90 to 95 percent of this is going to be cross-country. Eric and I flag through the woods our route. We are not following any kind of a trail. So if you have shorts, if you have sandals, uh, anything like that would be something I would consider not appropriate for this walk. Um, we are going to be, again, cutting through woods at times. I could tell from the vegetation when we flagged it that there are some going to be some briars about knee high that we go through or bushes we'll be walking through. At times you'll have to step over logs. There is at least one stream that we will have to leap over. Um, or if you have the boots like him, you can step in it and, and walk through it and not get your feet wet. Um, there will be, besides the stream, marshy areas and as you may know we recently had a lot of rain that resulted in some some flooding. I'm very anxious to see what kind of water is standing out there. I've not hiked the trail since that most recent rain that caused streams to flood. So um, I wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that up front as we go through our introduction to think and consider if you want to go along on the program. I already talked to at least one gentleman who's going to be with us here, walk down the railroad bed for our second cut, uh, excuse me, our second stop, and then after that is going to turn around and, and come back. So some of you may decide you wish to do that as well. Um, this is going to be like other potential um, things to cover logistically. Um, to be aware of ticks, I'm not sure <laughs> if they are out in force or not yet, but the ticks in the area have the potential to carry a disease called Lyme disease. If you find that you've had a tick on you, and I don't know what the cutoff time is, but say if you realize it must have been on you for two days or so, um, you should take the tick, put it in a double baggie, and put it in your freezer, and in case you get sick, they can uh, test that to see if it is... Uh, that is the source might be one of the easy ways to determine. Um, so those are, I think, the logistical things to get out of the way and have you think about as we delve into our introduction here. Now, uh, helping me with this tour today, my name is Greg Mertz, incidentally, is Eric Mink. Where did Eric disappear to? Eric is right behind me. <laughs> Eric and I had quite a few things in common. We both lived at Gettysburg at the same time. I was on the staff there from 80 to 84 at a time when, were you in high school then? <laughs> uh, junior. He was in junior high about that time, man. <laughs> we often wondered, he was interested in the Civil War as a kid, and we often wondered, gee, I wonder how many times we crossed paths on the battlefield, but I'm not going to, I guess, take an effort to say something to a junior high kid while I'm out there exploring on my own. <laughs> so we have that in common. Um, we are also, um, if we exclude uh, Green Springs as a, a section of the park, we are John's two direct subordinates. We share that in common. And we also uh, share something fairly recently in common that our, our teams, our, our most favorite sports teams, both went to the World Series last fall. Mm. Now, one of us is a little more excited about the World Series than the other. I'm a Cardinal fan from St. Louis, and Eric's uh, mother came from New England, and he grew up a Red Sox fan, so guess who is happy? Now, this is a testimony of our friendship that we are sharing in this tour uh, such a short time after the World Series. It is, even though the next season is upon us, it's still a, it's a short time after the 2013 World Series, right? So, um, so we'll be uh, alternating the different tour stops that we uh, have here today. 
Now to delve into an introduction to our campaign and what we're going to be addressing here tonight, uh, this uh, this morning. I said tonight, this afternoon, and now this morning. You can tell I'm sleep deprived, can't you? Um, Robert E. Lee had a goal of moving uh, into this direction so he could fight a battle in the wilderness. This type of vegetation he found to be too the favor of the Confederate Army, but he also wanted to delay that battle until he had his entire army upon the field. 150 years ago yesterday, Lee was able to select the wilderness location as a spot for a fight, but he could not delay the start time of that battle for his whole command to come up. And of the five Confederate divisions that would be fighting on this end of the battlefield, the Orange Plank Road sector of the battlefield, only two of them, two of those five divisions, were engaged on the first day. And on the second day of the battle, now with all of his forces united, one of the original goals of Robert E. Lee was to use James Longstreet as his main strike force. And that had not just been his plan for this battle, but it actually, in many respects, had been a plan for the past several months. Even in the aftermath of Gettysburg, you could argue that when James Longstreet's portion of this army was sent out west to fight in the Battle of Chickamauga and serve in Georgia and then subsequently in Tennessee, that the goal of the Confederacy was to take James Longstreet and send him to whatever place they saw the greatest opportunity for some type of offensive operation. Even looking at the big picture going into 1864 when the Confederate strategy was to try to make uh, the northern populace feel as much pain, if you will, from this battle, that when they go to the polls in November that they uh, would uh, defeat Abraham Lincoln in election to another term, James Longstreet appreciated his role in that and would comment um, in the early 1864, Lincoln's reelection seems to depend upon the results of our efforts during the present year. If he is reelected, the war must continue, and I see no way of defeating his reelection except by military success. And one of his comments in there is, if he is reelected, the war must continue. You might wonder if he's thinking if Lincoln is not elected, the war might end by, with the next candidate. And that's definitely part of what the Confederacy was hoping for. The target of this upcoming election was very, very significant. Now, even in the winter and looking at how James Longstreet could be utilized, um, he seems to be looked upon as this kind of mobile reserve force that is, is again going to get sent anywhere the Confederacy hopes to launch some kind of a, an offensive operation. Um, Lee, specifically noting the importance of taking the initiative, would write on the February 3rd of 1864, if we could take the initiative and fall upon them unexpectedly, we might derange their plans and embarrass them for the whole summer. And Specifically looking at where Longstreet could be utilized, there were three potential opportunities that the Confederates were considering. One out west on the other side of the Alleghenies, two here in Virginia. And the one that is the most interesting, in my opinion, is the one out west. James Longstreet actually came up with the idea that the Confederacy should try to mount his entire infantry corps on horses or mules that they would go up into Kentucky, an area that had not been dramatically touched by the war yet, where they might live off the land, gather supplies, cut Grant, and by this point, again, we're thinking Grant is still out west in the Chattanooga area, but cut some of his supplies, uh, or his supply line, I should say. Now, <coughs> some historians that have looked at this plan think of it as, as, as a wild kind of scheme, but Longstreet actually had some logic to it and it sounds like it might be innovative. If there's a large infantry force in Kentucky that is mounted, cavalry might catch up with it but doesn't have the firepower to do any harm. Federal infantry could do harm to it but it shouldn't be able to catch up with it because anytime a larger force got close to Longstreet's mounted command he could be able to ride off. 
So I find it very interesting and apparently got uh, enough consideration to have a big meeting down in Richmond between Longstreet and, and uh, uh, Lee and uh, Davis and Braxton Bragg, but in the long run it was decided the Confederates didn't have enough horses or mules to give this a try. The other two areas to look at were in Virginia. One, the Shenandoah Valley, perhaps have Longstreet do something similar to what Jackson had done, and the other, the logical thing, is to have uh, Longstreet return to Robert E. Lee that he might go against Meade's army. Subsequent things that the Union Army did would dictate what would happen and Lee found that he could not take the initiative because enough information was coming to him about various federal forces assembling here in the East that he was not sure how he would use James Longstreet. And on the eve of this battle, Longstreet is to the uh, southwest of us here, near the rail junction of Gordonsville, specifically because he might have to catch the train to go help to defend Richmond, or he might be ne needed to march up here and join this army. And when Grant initiated the wilderness campaign, it was then that the decision was made that Longstreet would come and rejoin this army. But even then, before the battle shaped up and while Lee is still making his plans, thinks of using Longstreet as a strike force. You appreciate that the northernmost road related to this battle, as far as the east, three east-west roads here, is the Orange Turnpike, which Ewell would use. The one closest to us, only three quarters of a mile, the Orange Plank Road that A.P. Hill's Corps would use. To the south of us is a road called the Catharpin. Longstreet originally was to move up on that road with the hope that he could crash into the flank of the Federals. If Hill and Longstreet would establish this kind of battle line in which the Federals were coming at them from the east, swing Longstreet to the south, move him north, and smash into that flank was the plan. But, again, the action on the day before with Hill getting into difficulty on the plank road caused Longstreet to be detoured and diverted to this particular portion of the battlefield. And as you saw early this morning, he would arrive at a very key time to make a significant contribution to this battle. While the fighting was going on in the Widow Tap field that you all just discussed, interesting things were happening right here in this area. Right beside us, and something we'll be walking into in just a moment, is an unfinished railroad bed. Um, a man by the name of Martin Luther, um, Martin Luther Smith, an engineer with the Army, along with a young former bank clerk who was Longstreet's chief of staff named Moxley Sorrell, would be part of a reconnaissance. They would ride down the railroad bed, which again is right off in this direction, heading on down to the east behind most of you. And as they progressed, they got opposite the Union Army, which was also behind you, and realized from the sound of fire that they were on the flank of the Federal Army. They went and uh, did a little more reconnaissance and found a ravine behind the Federal position that they thought could help to conceal some forces. They went back and would eventually report their findings at around 10 o'clock in the morning, 150 years ago, reporting those findings to Robert E. Lee. There was now a decision to be made. <clears throat> we know that, again, Lee's long looking for an opportunity to use Longstreet for an offensive operation. Was this the opportunity for it? The Army had been through a lot this morning. They had stabilized the situation in tacking across uh, the, the Widow Tap field. But was that enough? Should the Confederates that have now been hammered yesterday and uh, earlier this morning, should they be content with that? Or should they take advantage of learning of this new avenue of advance that hadn't been known and utilize it? A little about this avenue of advance through here that's now kind of been discovered by the Confederates. The Union Army, particularly the Second Corps, as they marched up on the Brock Road to get to the battlefield, had discovered it. But they didn't think much of it, and partly it's because at the place where they encountered the railroad bed, significantly further south than the battlefield, this railroad cut at a point where we're going to depart from it, starts to make a bend. Do notice as we walk out there that it's going to gradually curve a little bit to the right, and it's going to keep curving for quite a while. 
If you're looking for that spot that they travel on the Brock Road, you can find it. It is a, um, there is a yellowish building from, well I, well I should back up a little bit because the railroad was eventually finished. Uh, unlike some of the other railroad beds like at Second Manassas and so forth which never was completed, this one was started in 1853, was eventually completed in 1877 and utilized until 1939, or excuse me, 1938. Um, it went by a variety of names. My favorite name for it was the Piedmont, Fredericksburg, and Potomac. Not because of that name, but because it had the nickname of the PF and P, and the locals had another uh, uh, label for what those initials stood for. The PF and P said to stand for the Poor Folks and Preachers Line. <laughs> but you can still see one of the buildings from the, the PF and P, or one of its other names, on the Brock Road. If you're heading south, look on the right-hand side of the road for a yellowish building with some uh, red um, windows, if you will, and it's got an overhang where obviously when passengers used it, they could get some protection from the rain just past it. It's in a real low spot on the Brock Road, and just past it you can see a fire hydrant because there is a water line currently along it. So we now have this new avenue of advance discovered by the Confederates, not fully appreciated by the Union Army, even though they've, uh, they've uh, spotted it before. And our next stop, Eric, will explain to you what the Confederates decided to do once they learned that they got another way of maneuvering through the difficulty of the wilderness and that there is a flank that seems to be vulnerable right up ahead. Okay. Now, the, safe, excuse me, the easiest way for us to deal with this, because there's a stink grade right next to us, I'm going to walk down this way a little bit. We're going to make a bit of a U-turn so we can go down a more gentle slope. And again, if there's any doubt that uh, whether you can uh, take the program, uh, again, give that serious consideration. We want everybody to make it through. Thanks. say today, but you're probably going to remember this walk, because um, Greg and I have not uh, uh, have not walked what is in front of us since we flagged it, um, and so it has rained a, a, a fair amount uh, since then. So as Greg gave you fair warning at the beginning, before we leave this stop and lunge into the woods, um, just keep that in mind, because once you go in, there's probably little chance you're going to find your way back out this direction. Um, and uh, I don't think Greg is, is, would be embarrassed to, uh, uh, for me to say that when we came out to flag it, we didn't do a very good job our first time. Uh, we had flagging coming from two different directions that did not meet. So, uh, uh, fortunately, we had a GPS unit the second time. So, when we go into the woods, it is just nothing but untouched woods. Uh, so, it's easy to get turned around. Uh, our flagging will hopefully keep us, and I'm glad to see that it's still visible because we did use biodegradable flagging. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, more recent enough that we can actually find our way. Uh, we are passing around handouts. Uh, they are coming around. Uh, the handouts uh, are uh, usable, um, and we will be referencing them. Uh, as Greg mentioned, as we came down, uh, as we come down the unfinished railroad, and that is what we walked on. Uh, that has standing water in it, uh, that is the railroad grade. And if you look at the first map that is entitled Longstreet's Flank Attack on May 6, 1864, um, looking down where it says Unfinished Railroad, by the way, north is in front of us here, um, and looking at it, you will see the typical way of identifying a railroad on a map, sort of that hashed line um, where it bends. 
uh, we are in the proximity of that bend. If we were to continue east along the railroad, uh, the direction we were heading, uh, the railroad does gradually begin to bend and head to the south. So we are at that bend. Um, the railroad uh, grade that we were on, uh, 37 miles in length was the idea uh, for this railroad. Uh, it was to connect Fredericksburg with um, uh, Gordonsville and uh, Orange Courthouse off to our west. And uh, the, uh, the armies knew about it. The Confederates, as many of you know, uh, utilized it the previous year, in May of 1863. As it crossed through what is now the Chancellorsville battlefield, the then unfinished railroad passed just south of Catherine Furnace and just north of the Welford House. The uh, 23rd Georgia on May 2nd, 1863, used the railroad embankment as a defense um, against uh, Dan Sickles' 3rd Corps troops that were attacking the rear of Jackson's column. So the armies had been on this railroad in one form or another uh, the previous year. So Martin L. Smith uh, finding this avenue, um, it was known about, but as Greg said, the Union 2nd Corps chose not to really pay any attention to it. And as you look at that front map, um, that shows the situation after the morning attacks uh, that resulted in the fighting east of Widow Tap and once the lines became relatively uh, stable. And um, so you can see by utilizing this railroad as a third road, um, the road, makeshift road south of the Plank Road, if you could bring troops down, you could get below the left flank or the left end of the Union line. And so that's what Martin L. Smith found, was this avenue to bring a Confederate force down and then coming out of the railroad and attacking north uh, through the woods. Now, creating this attack force, once Longstreet and Lee had decided to make the attack, there were four brigades um, that would, or uh, three brigades and a portion of a fourth, uh, that would be part of this attack force. Uh, this assault uh, force that would utilize the railroad. And it's interesting to look at how they were uh, pulled together. Um, they came from different divisions and from two different corps. You had brigades that were from the 1st Corps under Longstreet. You also had some men from the 3rd Corps. And you had brigades from different divisions. So it's kind of almost um, a pulled together, cobbled together command. Um, and uh, the reason for that is they were utilizing for this attack uh, brigades that had not been perhaps heavily engaged early in the morning um, when Longstreet first arrived on the field, but more importantly, proximity to the battlefield and where they were. Um, so pulling these four brigades in their close proximity to the railroad to utilize it to make the attack and the fact that they were relatively, relatively fresh and unused. Um, the three brigades consisted of Brigadier General William T. Wofford's uh, three regiments and three battalions of Georgia troops. Uh, these were very aggressive, and uh, Wofford was a very aggressive and dependable uh, commander. Uh, you might recognize this as Thomas Cobb's old brigade, Georgians who were in the sunken road at Fredericksburg. Um, so, very dependable organization. You had Brigadier General George T. Anderson's five regiments uh, from Georgia. Solid, solid command that had seen much fighting up to this point of the war. Uh, and then there was Brigadier General William Mahone's five regiments from Virginia. Uh, and uh, Ma uh, Mahone, his brigades had not seen any fighting yet in the wilderness, uh, really hadn't seen much action at all um, in almost a year. Um, so uh, one might say that they were actually uh, perhaps eager uh, coming into this fight. And Mahone himself was a fighter, uh, would, quit, would eventually rise to division command and become one of the best division commanders in the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, so those were the three brigades. Oh, interestingly enough, Mahone was probably familiar with this railroad. Uh, the railroad was a competitor with the Orange Plank Road off to the north <coughs> for uh, travel east-west uh, through this section. And one of the engineers who was responsible for the Orange Plank Road prior to the war uh, running through this section was William Mahone. Uh, so Mahone uh, probably had some knowledge of this region and perhaps even the railroad itself. Uh, the fourth sort of brigade were a couple regiments, few regiments, from Brigadier General Joseph Davis's brigade, uh, Mississippians. Uh, Davis was uh, ill, so on this day the uh, brigade was being commanded by Colonel John M. Stone of the 2nd Mississippi. And so uh, they apparently sort of attached themselves to this command. 
um, as they appear in some reports and not in others. Um, but they, uh, some of the soldiers wrote about the attack and were most certainly here. Uh, they'd been pretty well beaten up early in the morning. Um, and so uh, they probably just attached themselves, uh, knowingly attached themselves to the, uh, to the uh, uh, attack. So you've pieced together this, stitched together this command, essentially a division, uh, three brigades, uh, part of a fourth, and you're pulling them from different divisions, different corps. Um, I think that speaks a little bit to what's going on here in the wilderness. Um, perhaps the chaos, uh, perhaps the uh, sort of de uh, desperation, not really desperation, but just the necessity um, and pulling together these brigades that come from different commands. Well, once you've done that and you've created this sort of makeshift division uh, that come from, who, who do you give a command to? Um, you know, they're from different divisions, these brigades. They're taken from their parent organizations. Um, William Mahone was the senior officer on the field, and uh, Mahone would later claim to have uh, led the attack. Uh, in fact, Longstreet, uh, in recommending Mahone for promotion afterwards, said that Mahone, quote, was entrusted its immediate direction, referring to this flank attack. Um, William Wofford, uh, the Georgia, one of the Georgia brigades, Wofford's men claimed he had been responsible for locating the railroad and recognized its importance. Not true, uh, but that's what his men claimed. Uh, in a wartime letter, uh, when Longstreet recommended Wofford for promotion, he said, much of the excess attending the movement is due to General Wofford. So Longstreet uh, praising both Mahone and Wofford uh, later on for their participation here. Uh, and then the third person is most likely the one who was in actual command, a lieutenant colonel. Um, and when I say in command, he was responsible for this, its direction. Uh, Mahone was more than likely um, immediately responsible for the actions on the field but this lieutenant colonel was responsible for the direction of this flank attack. And that was 26-year-old Gilbert Moxley Sorrell, uh, Longstreet's chief of staff. Um, so when we call it Longstreet's flank attack, uh, perhaps it should be Mahone's, maybe it should be uh, Sorrell's. Uh, but you'll see them on the back of the handout. We have uh, photos of Longstreet, Smith, Sorrell, um, and then a fourth individual we'll talk about a little later on. Um, but Sorrell seemed to be everywhere um, during this movement. Um, it seems odd to place a lieutenant colonel and staff officer in charge of this sort of makeshift division on a daring and important attack, but Longstreet had tremendous confidence in 26-year-old Moxley Sorrell. He was everywhere during the uh, movement. Uh, Longstreet, in his official report, said special instructions were given to Lieutenant Colonel Sorrell to conduct the attack. Much of the success of the movement is due to the very skillful manner in which the move was conducted by Lieutenant Colonel Sorrell. He later, um, um, uh, or Longstreet would uh, recommend Sorrell for promotion to Brigadier General after the uh, battle, and he said, Sorrell was assigned to represent me in this flank movement with instruction as to the ex execution of it. Um, so there you go. He's uh, stating, Longstreet is stating, um, that uh, Moxley Sorrell was given uh, instructions to represent Longstreet during the uh, movement and also uh, he was uh, responsible for its execution. Uh, in order for this, uh, for this uh, attack to uh, um, succeed, Longstreet also has to put pressure on the front of the Union line. If you look at your maps, you can come up from the uh, south, hit the flank of the enemy, um, but of course the enemy has the ability to turn and face you. Um, so part of the success of this flank attack, if it does uh, uh, succeed, is going to be Longstreet pressing down the plank road in the front, keeping those Union troops occupied in the front, not looking to the rear, or at least not um, fighting uh, to the left or to the rear. Uh, so Longstreet told Sorrell, hit hard when you start, but don't start until you have everything ready. I shall be waiting for your gunfire and be on hand with fresh troops uh, for further advance. So if caught between these two attacks, one coming from the front, one coming from the south, it's quite possible that Hancock, Winfield Scott Hancock, his command, the, the elements that he has up on the road of men from the 6th Corps, the 2nd Corps of the Union, 5th uh, Corps, it's quite possible that the combined uh, pressure of uh, Longstreet's flank attack and coming from uh, the west down the plank road 
could force Hancock to his uh, command to break, crumble, and perhaps even vacate the very important Brock Road, Plank Road intersection. So these three and a half brigades funnel down the road here. Um, the uh, uh, map that we have, you'll notice that there are some slight differences um, between the first two maps as to the arrangement and organization and um, the uh, placement of these brigades. Um, the information is a bit confusing as to what went on. These men were confused in these woods as they were advancing. Um, but really I would say probably I would uh, um, consider the second map. Uh, Sorrell's late morning attack, May 6, 1864, is probably the likely arrangement. Um, so you have Anderson's Georgians on the far right, Wofford, then Mahone, and then Davis's small regiments at the tail end. Uh, skirmishers and sharpshooters were sent out in front of these brigades before the attack was made. Um, they would be out there to flush any federal uh, skirmishers from the woods. And uh, finally, about 11 a.m., everything was set. The attack came out of the railroad that you're standing in, came over the embankment, and straight into the woods in front of us. Uh, somewhere out there in those woods was the left flank of the entire Union Army, the Army of the Potomac and that's what they were looking for. Um, if they struck and struck hard, the uh, uh, Confederates had a strong sense, uh, had a strong um, possibility of being successful on this end of the line. So with that, if you follow Greg and, and I, uh, if you follow Greg and me, we will enter the woods here. Uh, we have a tendency to walk very fast because we're trying to find where we're going next. Uh, do not feel the need to uh, keep up with us necessarily because we're going to be stopping so we can gather together. Some folks have asked a little bit about the, the upcoming activities. Um, on May 17th is an activity called To Freedom. It's going to take a look at the African-American role and something that many people may not be aware of is that the very first time any of Robert E. Lee's troops faced uh, United States colored troops was during the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse after the armies had pulled out of what you think of as the battlefield within the park. There was a cavalry um, command under Thomas Rosser that swung to the north and then east of what you think of as the battlefield heading up in the direction of Chancellorsville and stationed at the actual Chancellorsville crossroads at that time was um, a uh, command of United States colored troops that were called down to try to help repulse this cavalry raid and they were engaged. They lost um, just a handful of men. Um, I think three wounded is perhaps uh, the amount of casualties, but interestingly the very first time that they ever uh, engaged African American troops. So that is what is happening on the 17th. Um, and then on the 18th, Frank and I, Frank O'Reilly and I are going to give a program on Lee's last line. And probably after that, we're, we're going to do something just kind of impromptu that's not announced going over to the Harris Farm. But those are some of the other activities that might look a little obscure of the, the things that you have in the program booklet. Okay, that's my symbol that everybody's up? Okay. All right, thank you, Peter. Could I have a question, please? Oh, sure. I visited the Harris Farm site, and I think I glimpsed the, the farm, or is there any, anything left of the farm on the hill? 
If you ever go to the Harris Farm site, which is uh, preserved by the local Central Virginia Battlefields Trust, there is a house back there, which is obviously not one of the, the brand new homes. It does have some siding on it that is not of the era, but that older looking home with the non-historic siding on is the Harris House. So the Harris House does still stand, built in the late, late 1700s. You're welcome, that's good. All right. This is a little bit of an intermediate stop. We wanted to pick some place after we got over the stream to regroup before we head on up to our, uh, our stop on the location that we feel is the uh, brigade marking the extreme flank of the Union Army. But to get everybody oriented here and explain to you what you've done, if you, again you'd like to take the map that says Sorrell's late morning attack, May 6, 1864. It's probably the more detailed map, I would say, of the, of the various maps. If you do hold that with um, the top in my direction, I'll try to hold my hand up and point my phone for those of you that can't see me well, but that's generally the, the area at the top of the map. You can see near the bottom of the map that you did leave the unfinished railroad grade, probably somewhere in the area near where Wofford and Mahone kind of come together. You've marched up and uh, as you see those arrows swing up, you'll see that there is a stream that had to be crossed um, between the railroad bed and where McAllister is. That is the stream that you just hopped across a little while back. And then you came up onto this little knoll where you can see some hash marks that is just um, beneath McAllister. Um, that's somewhere where we are now. I wanted to pick a spot after we crossed over the stream to come up here where I thought we got out of enough of, out of, enough of the swampy area that we could all stand in some degree of relative comfort. But while we're here, I do want to mention a, a few things that would be of, of interest. Uh, First, a little bit about Martin L. Smith. We touched upon him. Um, one of the things that got me curious about why he was with this army is because when the armies are down at Spotsylvania Courthouse, after Doles' attack, for those of you familiar with that, on the evening of uh, May 10th, Robert E. Lee sent a message to Ewell telling him he'd better prepare to potentially repulse a night attack, saying it was a favorite amusement of Grant when he was in Vicksburg. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I wonder, you know, first it was kind of obvious to me that because Martin L. Smith had been at Vicksburg, that he's probably the one that advised Robert E. Lee of this. And it got me thinking, I wonder if he's with the Army specifically to give some advice of what this new man that they know of in the East is, is apt uh, to do, what are some of his tendencies. And after looking at some of the correspondence of Robert E. Lee requesting Martin L. Smith, I found uh, that was definitely not the case. <clears throat> that what Lee was looking for was simply an engineer that had a relatively high rank. I got the impression uh, you know, from the message that with earthworks becoming more and more important, that uh, he would like somebody more than a rank of colonel to be able to go to some unit and give it instructions of how to build their earthworks. He didn't go out and say that, but that's the impression I got, that he would really like an engineer that had some degree of authority. He was not requesting anyone in particular, but obviously now that uh, Martin L. Smith is part of this army, he's uh, sharing. I can't imagine there's anybody else. I don't have evidence that he's the one that passed on the message that Grant likes to launch night attacks, but um, I can't imagine anybody else would be the one that would share that. So a little bit about Martin L. Smith. He did talk about um, uh, when he made his reconnaissance that he found a ravine leading in rear of the Union uh, command. While we can't see that very well from here, that would be off in that direction. And as you look at your map, you can see that when we cross over the stream that I talked about, that kind of the main body of the, the stream running through this area um, is to the rear of McAllister. I don't know to what degree he left the railroad cut and came up into this area, but to be aware of that ravine, especially now that you've had a chance to go over some of the ground and see all the other undulating things, this was not something that was real evident back at the railroad cut. I think he must have left the railroad cut, wandered somewhere in our direction the way we did, and found the ravine somewhere further in that direction. <coughs> 
So, as, as this command made the attack, as we have now been following, when we got to the stream bed, um, Moxley Sorrell, who was mounted on a horse, decided that he would offer a color bearer of the 12th Virginia, whose name is Ben May, some help in getting across the stream with that flag. As you can imagine, um, going through these woods, it's getting difficult enough now, but picture what this would have been like in the wilderness. When you have thick vegetation, the trees are not tall, mature trees like this, but generally around 30 feet tall at the highest, trees growing very close together and a lot more undergrowth, you can see that it would be difficult to get through. And what Sorrell had to say was this, he said, he was doing all that a man could do with his colors, but seemed to be somewhat embarrassed by the bushes. And I thought perhaps I might help to get them forward, mounted as I was. Um, he positively refused uh, to let them leave his own hands. I was filled with admiration for his splendid courage. And he went on in his note as he's talking with someone about Ben May that he learned that he was um, shot on May 12th as he understood it down at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Um, again, when Ben May refused, one of the other accounts says that he shouted back, we will follow you. And so Sorrell um, led his men on up uh, in this direction and uh, one of the accounts said of him, we had not proceeded very far when Colonel Sorrell appeared on the scene and placing himself in front with his hat in one hand and grasping the reins of his horse with the other exclaimed, follow me Virginians, let me lead you. Probably somewhere very close to where we are at now as we are approaching the federal position when these men realized that they were in uh, position to begin their assault. They no longer are concerned, I guess, with secrecy, but would like to put the fear into the federal forces up ahead. What's that <clears throat> hint of what is to come? Rebel yell. The rebel yell. One of Wofford's men said that we raised the old rebel yell and went on them like a duck on a June bug. <laughs> I have to pay attention next time I watch Duck Dynasty to see what, how ducks attack a June bug. But that was his analogy, quaint as it is, of what happened when they fell upon the forces just up ahead of them. Um, before we go, this is kind of a filler stop. One other thing that I forgot in my first stop, and I think we missed in the other stop. We didn't give proper thanks to Fawn Lake, did we, Eric? Or did I miss you saying something about it? Okay. Um, folks have been asking me kind of a long way, are we in the park? Is this private property? The private property got permission to go on was the railroad bed itself. Some of you may notice as you were marking, walking along, if you look to the left, you saw a, a National Park Service boundary marker. We as a National Park Service own from the Orange Plank Road all the way down to the edge, that northern, yes, northern edge of the railroad bed but we don't own the railroad bed or anything further to the south. So to get a chance to go, walk in the fills and grades of the railroad bed, got permission from Fawn Lake Subdivision, and they have been very helpful in everything. You may have noticed when you're parking in here at a sales center or a ball field, that is with uh, their permission, and um, we could not have done this program or the others that we've done on this end of the battlefield without the kind of support that they provided. So I want to make sure a big <coughs> shout out and thank you to Fawn Lake goes out. So, okay. so with that, just a little bit more of forward and onward till we get to the Union position and on the flank of the Union Army.
I know what she, I know what she's spotted or what she's talking I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's the dinner. Rob is asking a question about the uh, the acreage that was added uh, to the park boundary when um, this whole parcel um, came in, and it was about a 500 acre parcel. And said at the time we, but you read something that announced that 21 percent of the battlefield was saved in 1998. Now, I don't know if that's a poor study. I'm not. Sure. <coughs> well, this battlefield right now has about. I think this is our largest holding, if I remember correctly, and we have approximately 20, 2,500 acres here. So if this was a 500-acre addition, we had 2,000 before that, so that gives you an idea of how that might have impacted that. We had another question about the bus tour on, at Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 10th. Frank uh, is here, and he said that he is of the understanding that the morning bus tour is sold out, but there are some tickets remaining for the afternoon bus tour. So, if anybody was interested in that. I think I see Peter, so are we close to all being up? Are we all here, Peter? All right, if you pull out that same map that I was referring to before, the one that is a little more detailed, to get you oriented, we are up in the vicinity of where you see McAllister. So you're approaching the length of the ridge. McAllister troops would be along this ridge, facing off in this direction, which for most of you would be off to the left. This is the extreme Union left flank on this morning. Now, to look ahead a little bit at what else will go on later on tonight, in which includes Gordon's flank attack on the other end of the battlefield, I think it's worthwhile to entertain the question, how on earth does a Union Army with 118,000 men get both of its flanks turned by their army that has a strength of around 65,000 men or so? And there are different reasons for both ends of the field. Here at this end of the field, I think the primary word that we can look at um, to give an explanation is the word distraction. <coughs> the man who's in charge of this end of the battlefield, the Corps Commander Winfield Scott Hancock, is distracted. And also the Brigade Commander that would have been right in front of us here, Robert McAllister, is distracted as well. They're both distracted by different things that will prevent them from getting a good understanding of what has happened after the fight in the Widow Tap field and will enable them to basically miss the, the fact that Confederates are in the railroad cut. Now what is the distraction that Winfield Scott Hancock as a Corps Commander is undergoing? In the fighting around the Widow Tap field, they have obtained prisoners from all of the units that have been involved. Union High Command down here is now aware that James Longstreet is up. They have captured men from Fields' division. They've also captured men from Kershaw's division. But there's another division which the Union High Command believes is on paper as a portion of James Longstreet's command that they have not had any contact with. What division would that be? George Pickett's famous division. Well, George Pickett isn't anywhere near here, but there is some firing that erupts to the south of them along the Catharpin Road in the vicinity of Todd's Tavern. For those aware of that, that's about oh, four miles, three or four miles south of the battlefield from us. And there is speculation that this might be Longstreet's other missing division coming up to flank us from the south, but not from the railroad bed, but from the Brock Road, further on to the east. They're afraid or fearful that there is a movement that is going to be moving up toward them, hitting their flank on the Brock Road. So Hancock is taking a division commanded by Francis Barlow and positioning it due south of what we think of as the battlefield. Some of you, if you've been around uh, covering Chancellorsville and have taken our driving tour for 
uh, Jackson's flank attack. You may have noticed some markers there and earthworks talking about those being earthworks from the Battle of the Wilderness. And you may be wondering, what on earth are earthworks doing way down there, far away from the Battle? Well, some of those are Francis Barlow's earthworks as he's looking to guard the Brock Road from an attack coming up from the south. So that's why Hancock is not paying attention to this particular area. For McAllister, the brigade commander on the knoll right ahead of us, he is being distracted by another brigade. A brigade which happens to be from Barlow's command, commanded by a man named Paul Frank. Now McAllister was of the impression that Barlow's division was going to be taking position over the ground that we just walked. And as you might imagine, a division could easily fill the spot from where we are on down to the railroad cut and be able to intercept an attack coming in from the west and prevent the, the Confederate forces from utilizing the railroad dead. But, um, again, Barlow's men are not filling into position here except a small number. And uh, Paul Frank, the colonel in charge of this brigade, um, there's some things written about him that are not very complimentary. A uh, federal staff officer referred to Frank as a whiskey-pickled, lately arrived, blusterous German. If you for a moment here, I'd like for you to look at both of the maps and look for Frank. Now, in the map that I've had you looking at, you can see that Frank is ahead of McAllister, so that places him over in that direction. If you want to take a glimpse at the other map, the bigger one, where do you find Frank on it? Do you see him in front of McAllister? You find him to the rear. Well, part of the reason why this could be is a little bit of confusion over where he was at particular times. Part of it is just having a map show one isolated moment is almost impossible to do. But the other factor is that Frank is moving around, and that is causing some problems. One of the things that Matt McAllister noted is that as he was in position on this knoll, he said that uh, Frank came up from the rear and said that he wished to pass through his line to get to the front, as you saw in that one map. And, Frank, and um, Colonel McAllister explained to him, you know, I've got my command set, I've got my skirmishers established out in front, for you to pass through my mind would just disrupt it. So told him, no, you can't pass through my line. So Frank eventually, I guess, went down in the area that we just passed, swinging around, taking his position in the front. And um, while they were incidentally talking over what their role should be, Frank asked McAllister if he would support him in an attack on the Confederates. And Frank said, no, I won't. I mean, McAllister said that he would not. said his specific orders were to do whatever the troops on his right, further ahead of you and further on the right flank of McAllister would do. If those troops move forward in an attack, he is supposed to do so as well. If those troops stay put, he's to stay put. <clears throat> Uh, kind of interesting orders. Normally you don't find the officers have orders to simply do what the command next to you does, but perhaps that's an interesting characteristic of the fighting in the wilderness and the difficulty of the communications here that he's given those kind of instructions. Well, after he explained to uh, Colonel Frank that he would not be participating in an attack, Frank replied that he had orders to, quote, find the enemy wherever he could find him and whip him. Sounds a little uh, uh, confident in himself of what he was going to do, but at any rate, now he moves around again to the left flank of McAllister, gets himself in position, and as McAllister would say, but little firing took place until some of his men came running back. And in a few minutes, a verbal message came for me to relieve him. A few minutes more, all his troops came running back. I had my men stop them and refuse to let them through. Colonel Frank then came up after, again, the, the men are all stopped. And you can understand why McAllister would want to do that. There's just some shooting in his front that obviously attracts his attention. And if the men are falling back, it could be because the Confederates are launching an assault and you will want to halt these men, um, try to rally them along your line. Well, eventually, again, Colonel Paul Frank comes back and says, uh, I need to go back and get some ammunition. 
<laughs> and McAllister asks, he says, where do you want to go for ammunition? He says, oh, look, I want to go somewhere further on to the rear. And he said, uh, McAllister said, hey, uh, a mule supply train of ammunition has just come up. It's to the right of my brigade. Give me a detail of men, and I'll send them with one of my sergeants to get you ammunition. Well, that didn't pacify him. So eventually... Um, Frank will leave the area, and that's why you possibly see him further to the rear in one of the other maps. So while, again, at a time when McAllister is on the flank, sees that the troops that are expected to come up beside him are not here, and he ought to be uh, exploring the area, he has to deal with Paul Frank and his wanting to pass to the front and whip the enemy and get ammunition and all this other kind of nonsense. So eventually Frank gets out of the way, and now McAllister can finally get about his business and see what is around him. He said, I took an orderly with me and went through the picket line to reconnoiter. I cro Why am I getting feedback here? Where do I need to stand? Let's try that. Thank you. Um, I took an orderly with me and went through the picket line to reconnoiter. By crawling along from tree to tree in front, I discovered a ravine. And in the ravine were enemy pickets. A short distance in rear of enemy pickets was a railroad cut, and on the left across a ravine was an embankment. There was the position of the enemy. After taking careful survey of it, I came back and sent an aide to report the fact that General Mott commanding division. So again, McAllister's a brigade commander. He's reporting to his superior. Gershom Mott of what he has found. About 11.30 a.m., I heard firing on my left and rear. I soon discovered we were flank. I immediately ordered a change of front to meet it. So by a change of front, what he is doing is taking his command that was oriented to the west, off in that direction, and swinging them around this knoll facing um, the direction that I am now and the people behind me are facing. And I should add that as I read different secondary accounts, a lot of people interpret what McAllister said in a variety of ways. I think he's pretty clear that once he changes front, from that point on, when he talks about what's happening in his front, he means what's happening in the area behind you. I don't think he's talking about the front of the army as a whole, but his own front. So he said, the line was soon formed facing the enemy, and by that I think he means facing the flank attack, when General Mott and staff came up and was informed of the difficulty. At this time, some troops were engaging the enemy in my front. They held the enemy in front, delivered volley after volley into their ranks, but I soon discovered they had flanked my left. So I think curling around the left are perhaps some of the men of, as you look at your map, uh, again, uh, you'll notice a different order, I think, in some of the commands, but that perhaps some of Wofford's men, and uh, I know that at the next stop, um, Eric will get into this more, but that Mahone and Wofford do, by all means, most of the fighting. So I would say Wofford, perhaps it is Anderson, is now curling around in that direction further to the east of us, getting into his rear. <coughs> Um, so I soon discovered that they had flanked my left and were receiving a fire in my front, on my left and rear. Here my horse was mortally wounded by two or three rifle balls, but still able to move slowly. At this time my line broke in confusion and I could not rally them short of the breastworks. When he says breastworks, he means the breastworks that were built along the Brock Road. Um, that built by the first soldiers that arrived here on the 150 years ago yesterday before the, the troops were sent into the attack for those that went on our you know, afternoon, late afternoon program. So again, he can, his troops just break and he cannot rally them at all till they get to those earthworks. Pretty short and simple for the, the degree of fighting that he describes from his troops. The Confederates, uh, you know, whenever you hear a Union soldier say that they fought in a short period of time and collapsed quickly, you can probably hint that, you know, because usually the attitude is to give yourself more of a benefit of a doubt and paint yourself on a little better picture. So if you hear them say that 
if you hear them say that their uh, command has fallen apart quickly, you, you know they're, they're right on target and you wouldn't expect anything different from what the Confederates report. But a soldier in Wofford's command said, some few of them, meaning the Federal soldiers, fired. A good many of them ran, throwing down their guns as they went. Some lay flat on the ground. So with this, another successful Confederate flank attack is underway on, again, from the ridge right in front of you. And we're going to continue following in the footsteps of probably Mahone's men, maybe a little bit of some of the, uh, the soldiers of Wofford. But as we advance uh, to see what kind of things the Confederates are going to encounter next, and Eric will fill us in on that at our next stop.